All right, so far today you've talked about transactions and blocks and the blockchain. So those are the fundamental building blocks of, of Bitcoin. Those are the, the data structures that we use. Um, on a more practical level, how, do we, how does the Bitcoin network actually function? How do we transmit these transactions and blocks around? Well, the answer to that is the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what the P2P network is. I'll talk about different kinds of nodes on that network. There are different nodes. I'll talk about the message format. I'll talk about control messages, transaction propagation, and finally, block propagation. Okay, so what is the peer-to-peer -peer network? Well, it's how transactions and blocks are propagated from your node across to the other nodes in the Bitcoin network. It's a completely flat, open, peer-to-peer -peer network. There's no authentication, there are no special control master nodes or anything like that. Each node on the network is a peer. And it needs to be resistant to attacks because it's open, right? There's no, there's no wall between Bitcoin and the rest of the world. Bitcoin must be resistant to things like denial of service attacks, Sybil attacks, and so on. Um, so what kind of messages make up the peer-to-peer -peer network, what kind of messages do we send? Uh, version, Virac, adder, get adder, inf, get data, get blocks, get headers, transaction blocks, headers, ping, pong, um, lots of different messages. We'll, we'll go over some of those in this session. So how do, how do we connect to that network? Well, initially we connect to something called a seed node. A seed node will tell us about other nodes on the network using the adder message. The adder is telling us about the address of other nodes that we can reach on the network. And your Bitcoin Core node will connect to up to eight outbound connections, outbound peers. You know, other implementations may, be, may do something different, but for Bitcoin Core, it's eight. And you may or may not accept in, inbound. That's a, an option you can set. So your outbound nodes, they're the important ones. They're, where you're, they're what you're relying on. Inbound could be anything. So far, so good? OK, so it's a completely open network. You could connect to something that's complete garbage. right? You, you don't know. You don't know what you're connecting to. So if you connect to a node that misbehaves, they need to be removed somehow. Um, they waste our system resources. They take up slots that could be used for honest nodes. And, and those things are bad. Um, right? So if they're wasting our system resources, that's leaving us open to denial of service attacks. Right, they might blow up our memory usage or network usage or disk usage. If they're taking up slots that could be used for honest peers, well, that leaves us open to a Sybil attack or an Eclipse attack where we're being surrounded by dishonest nodes and we can't get the actual state of the network. So we can do, well, let's talk about what bad behavior might involve. You know, it might be invalid transactions or blocks. That's pretty easy for us to see, right? If a, because we validate everything we see, if a peer sends us an invalid transaction, we we can see that instantly. They might send us unconnected blocks, right? They might send us blocks that don't connect onto our chain, which is, in some cases, that's valid. We, we might be missing some blocks in the chain, and they're telling us about what's at the tip. But you know, if they keep sending us unconnected blocks, maybe they're feeding us a false chain, something that's valid, but is not the actual true most work chain. They could stall, right? They could be attacking us somehow by using up our slots, but just sending us information really slowly so we don't get the most recent blocks, or it takes us a long time to, to reach a tip. They could send us things called non-standard transactions. So there are two types of rules in Bitcoin. There's consensus rules. Something that is invalid by consensus is just completely invalid. Standardness is more about how we propagate transactions before they get in a block. And transactions can be non-standard, which means by default we won't propagate them around. But a peer might send us a bunch of non-standard transactions. An empty transaction, um, a transaction, an empty block. No, uh, anything in a block is standard. Right? Standardness only applies to transactions outside blocks. Um, there'd be things like. Um, before CSV, before check, sig, check sequence verify was activated, we might make using that opcode non-standard 
So those transactions don't get propagated around, and then when CSV is activated, it becomes standard. It's a way of managing soft forks, and, and we had non-standard rules for SegWit as well. Or we might just get malformed messages. We might get something that is actually complete garbage. So what do we do about that? We have a few options. Uh, we might just ignore that, right? Just drop the message and continue. Stay connected to the peer. Don't take any action. We could di disconnect the peer immediately if it's something bad. We could ban the peer that's slightly stronger. That's where we disconnect them and make sure they don't reconnect within 24 hours. Or we can apply DOS points. And we might ap apply 10 DOS points if they do something bad. And when their DOS score reaches 100, we ban them. This stuff is always changing within Bitcoin Core. It's not optimal right now. We can do better. But these are the kind of the options we have. Any questions about that? Yeah, so um, the question was, how does a DOS score work? It's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, by default, if a peer reaches 100 points, then we ban them. And we'll give them 10 points if they feed us 10 unconnected blocks, for example. I think that's right. So you can rack up your, your points. Yeah. And then you'll be banned after, after you've reached 100. And that lasts, that lasts 24 hours. This is our node making decisions about its peers. I won't go into that in any more detail, but that's kind of the high level. OK, let's talk about different types of node on the network. First of all, the gold standard is a full node, otherwise known as a fully validating node. That's because it validates all of the rules, all of the consensus rules of Bitcoin. It receives blocks as they're mined and propagated. It verifies the validity of those blocks. It verifies that all of the transactions in that block are valid and are spending unspent outputs. And it enforces the consensus rules of the Bitcoin network. Um, what it needs in order to do that is to keep a collection of all of the unspent outputs. That's kind of the set of information that, that we're interested in. It's the most secure and the most private way to use Bitcoin, right? If you use your own full node, you're validating the rules. You're making sure that there's no extra inflation, that there's no double spends. And it's also the most private because you're not telling anyone about your addresses or your public keys. There's the concept of a prune node. This was introduced in V10 or V12, I think. Um, a prune node is a full node. It's still validating all of the rules of the Bitcoin network. The only difference is it's discarding old blocks after it's validated them. That saves on disk space. Um, it's got to retain a bit of history, up to two days, I think two days minimum, and the undo data that I told you about. So if there's a reorg, even if it's a day reorg, like that would be a really large reorg, it can still do that. It propagates the new blocks that it sees. But it can't serve old blocks to appears. So when you turn your node on for the first time, you need to download all of the blocks in the blockchain. That's called initial block download. If you connect to a full node that doesn't prune, you can download all of the old blocks. If you connect to a prune node, obviously they can't serve you those old blocks because it's pruned them away. And in terms of security, it's as secure as a full node. It is a full node, right? It's validating all of the rules. It's making sure. The miners aren't increasing inflation. It's making sure that there aren't double spends. It's a full node, but it's just saving a bit of disk space. When you connect to a full node, you know that the node is pruned? Yes. Or you just discover by the fact that it doesn't fetch you all these blocks? Uh, well, you don't know that it's pruned. You know that it can't serve your blocks because in its version message, it doesn't send you a service bit node network. And I'll talk about version and, and service bits later. But you know that you can't get blocks from it. Yeah. yeah. Is it root uh, from consider the implementation for a uh, paragraph number seven Satoshi white paper that's going to be in this space? Yeah. Is this considered to be the implementation of that? 
kind of, yeah. Um, I, I haven't read that chapter recently on, in the white paper. Um, Yeah, that, that is slightly different. So a full node has two types of data. It has the blocks as they were serialized, which it's storing on its disk, and that will be up to 200 gigabytes at this point. And it has a set of unspent transaction outputs. What you need in order to enforce the rules on the network is that set, the UTXO set. The, the block, the archive of blocks is basically dead data. Um, you, you don't use it for validation, and if you remove that and you just have the UTXO set, you can still validate all of the rules. So that UTXO set does not include spent outputs. Those spent outputs have already been removed. So that, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that white paper in chapter seven in my head, but yeah, it does sound like it's slightly different. Any other questions about pruning? Okay, I'm gonna talk about archival nodes. Um, all I mean by that is it's a full block that stores the entire history, right? It's, it's like an archive. And it can serve blocks to its peers on the network. Unlike a prune node, which can't serve all blocks, an archival node can serve you any block in the history. And that's signaled using the node network service bits in the version handshake. So that should answer your question. Next, an SPV node. SPV nodes only download the block headers and information about specific transactions. And when I say information, um, I mean the Merkle proof that that transaction was included in a block. So they can validate proof of work because that's included in the headers, but they can't validate other network rules. They can't detect an invalid transaction has been included in a block, and they can't verify the money supply. So if all if all of the nodes on the network were using this system, except the miners who are mining, the miners could inflate money, right, because no one would be checking them. Um, they, can they can verify inclusion of transactions, and they can't verify exclusion. We don't have that kind of proof. They can use something called bloom filters to preserve a bit of privacy. They're not great. A bloom filter is my SPV node talking to a full node, and saying, I'm interested in this set of transactions or this set of addresses, but I'm not gonna tell you exactly what address is. Um, with that kind of filter, you'll always get the transactions that you're interested in if the full node is being honest, um, but the, the full node can't exactly fingerprint exactly what, what your address is. Um, these are, they're not great. There are better better systems out there, but this is what we have right now in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So a few other node options in Bitcoin Core. Blocks only does what you'd imagine. It's a full node which doesn't propagate transactions outside of blocks, right? So it's still validating all of the rules, all the full consensus rules, but it's just not propagating those block transactions outside of block. No listen means that you won't accept incoming inbound connections. You'll make outbound, but you won't listen for inbound connections. You can connect over Tor. That, that preserves a bit of privacy, perhaps. Using the Onion option, you can connect over a proxy. Um, and then there's a, 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 the concept of a whitelist, which is you connecting to a node. You, you'll never disconnect or ban them, and you'll always propagate transactions to them. Any questions? Yep. Uh, the question was, is there a limit to how many SPV nodes a full node can serve? Um, there must be some limit on the number of inbound connections. I don't know it off the top of my head. Maybe someone else? No? It's 125 total. Pardon? 135 total connections. Yeah, so you can have up to eight outbound. Those are the, those are the peers that you care about. They're, they're important to you. You're expecting to get information from. And the total for outbound plus inbound is 135, apparently. What is the difference between full node and archival node? I'm not 
sure about the, the feature of a parallel mode. And I, I'm not sure this is like a canonical definition, but not, I, what I mean when I say this, it's a full node, because it's validating all of the rules, but it's, it's not a prune node. It's serving up old blocks to peers. So any full node which is not prune is a parallel? If it's serving blocks to its peers, yeah. Yeah. So pruned is a kind of four node. Archival is also a kind of four node. So archival nodes, do they advertise themselves as some kind of a system of record? What's the point of those tabs there? Um, the question is, how does an archival node advertise itself? Again. I'm just using this word archival in, in a vague sense. What I mean is it will serve old blocks. And a node signals that it can serve old blocks using the node, the node network service bit in the version handshake. So when you connect to it for the first time, it will say, I'm, I have node network, which means I will serve you blocks. Any other questions? OK. Let's talk quickly about the message format. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer messages have a header and a payload. The header is 24 bytes long. It's a fixed length, and it's got certain fields in, fixed fields. It's got magic at the front. That's just four bytes, four fixed bytes, saying that this is a message on the Bitcoin network. Um, for the main net, it is F9BE B4D9. Just what Satoshi chose to identify messages for the Bitcoin mainnet. Testnet has a different four bytes leading. Litecoin has a different four byte magic. Bitcoin Cash has the same magic, but they claim that they're gonna change to a different magic. Um, 2X tries to pretend it's Bitcoin. Um, after the four bytes of magic, you have 12 bytes of command name. That's ASCII, just saying what the command in the payload is, for example, adder for address message, in for inventory um, version. So if you just parse out the those 12 bytes, it will be ASCII for the, what the command is. Then you've got a payload size, four bytes on how long the payload is in bytes. That puts a limit on the size of the payload at 32 megabytes. And then a checksum that was added in a later version, um, which is a double SHA-256 of the payload. That's kind of a lousy network checksum, but that's what it is. So that's your 24 bytes. And then you have a payload which is up to 32 megabytes. And each command has its own defined format. So that's what it looks like. Four bytes of magic, command, payload side, checksum, and then the body or the payload. So here's an example header. Those first four bytes are always the same, network magic. Then you have the um, you have the command name. So if you can read ASCII, you can see that hex seventy six is V, sixty five is E, and so on. Um, for Verac, the payload size is always zero. There's no payload for Verac, and then a checksum, which is char two five six or char two five six off the empty string because the payload is zero. Does that make sense? Pretty simple format. Okay, so there's two really kinds of message on the network. There's control messages and there's inventory or data messages. Let's look at the most important control messages. And probably the most important is the version, version Verac handshake. Um, every new connection on the network starts with this, this handshake. I connect to a peer, I send him a version, he sends me a Verac. He sends me his version, I send him a Verac. That's the handshake. <coughs> Uh, it's used by nodes to exchange information about, about themselves. Um, so there's a VRAC. Okay. Um, so what's inside a version message? There's the version. That's four bytes. It's the highest version that the transmitting node can connect to. Right? It's, it's usually your version. Um, then there's the service bits. And that's a bit field of the services that your, your the transmitting node Supports. So one of those services is node network. 
that says I can send out blocks. I'm a full node that can send blocks and transactions. Uh, there's a node witness which says I understand what SegWit is and I can send you witness blocks and witness transactions and so on. Then there's a timestamp. So a timestamp tells the receiving node this is what I view the time as and um, nodes on the network take account of what their peers think the time is in certain circumstances. Um, then there's a bunch of add or receive. Um, so this is, sorry, let me do that again. Um, the transmitting node is saying, I think that you support these services and I think this is what your IP address is and your port is. And then the add or trans services, that's the transmitting node saying, these are the services that I support and this is what I think my address is. So that add a trans service should be the same as the services field. Then there's a nonce. That's eight bytes of randomness to ensure that a node isn't connecting to itself. There's a user agent, which for Bitcoin Core is Satoshi and then the version because Bitcoin Core is the descendant of the Satoshi client. And then there's a start height, which is saying, this is the height of my tip. This is how far through the blockchain I've advanced. And then there's this like bool, which is optional. And that's saying, send me, send me ins or transactions. Any questions about that? So that's what we send out when we first connect to a peer. Yeah. You connect to outbound connections. So it's that outbound you're receiving from the outbound. Yep. So inbound is what you send out to the outbound system. Uh, both. You, you'll transmit to inbound and outbound. Yeah. It's to make to make sure you don't connect, don't accidentally connect to yourself. And, yeah. Weird. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know the history of that one. In the version. Oh. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Apparently, it's to stop yourself connecting to yourself. <laughs> yep. Uh, so a transaction is a way of transferring value on the Bitcoin network. A message is a network envelope of data that you're sending to a peer. So yes, <coughs> a message contain, could contain a transaction, yep. And I'll talk about how transactions are sent using those messages. Okay, so just quickly spinning through the other control messages, Virac. That's a response to a version. It's acknowledging that it's received that version head message. Adder is how we gossip information about the network. So if I'm connected to some peers, I'll send out an adder saying, these are the peers I've, I've connected to, is how we, we build out our, our view of the peer-to-peer -peer network. <coughs> Get adder is requesting information about additional peers. Ping and Pong, connect, confirming connectivity. So I send out a ping, I expect a Pong in response. And then there's these filter load. These are for setting up the Bloom filters um, that I told you about for the SPV nodes. And I think that's it. There might be a few others. Send headers, send compact. All right, so how, how is a transaction? To answer your question, how do we propagate a transaction across this network? Uh, well, new transactions are announced with an inv message. And that stands for inventory. It means we have new inventory to share. Um, that contains the transaction ID. That's the hash of the transaction, excluding the witness, um, which is the unique identifier for that transaction. Uh, INVs can also be used to propagate blocks, but that's not so common these days. It, originally, that's how blocks were propagated, but not so anymore. If the receiving node wants that transaction, if it hasn't seen it before, it sends a get data saying, yep, send me that transaction, and then the announcing node will send a TX message. So it looks like that, pretty simple. Transmitting node sends an inv, receiving node wants that transaction, so it sends a get data, and the transmitting node sends a tx. Make sense? Yeah, pretty easy. 
Okay, so that's transactions. Blocks, how do we propagate those? Well, initially, they were propagated in the same way as transactions in get data block. In v10, we introduce what's called headers first, syncing. In v12, we introduce send headers. v13, introduce compact blocks. v14, introduce high bandwidth compact blocks. Um, and all of this is an effort to make block propagation faster and more efficient because block propagation is really important. The faster blocks propagate across the network, the lower the stale block rate and the better, the more healthy, the better the system runs. Transactions, it doesn't matter if they get delayed a bit, but blocks really need to get across the network more quickly. Um, and that's why there's a parallel network called Fiber that Matt Corrado maintains. That's a way of transmitting and propagating blocks really, really fast, speed of light fast. So let's talk about some of those block propagation methods. Headers first is where the transmitting block sends an in for the block hash, just like normal, but it also, but the, the receiving node sends a get headers in response and a get data. So it's saying send me the headers and also send me the block. Uh, this is good because that in could include a block that doesn't connect to our tip. It might be like a real going back to somewhere else in the chain. And the get headers is saying send me all of the headers back to where I, I know about in the chain. The transmitting node sends the headers, connecting the tip to the receiving node's best block and the block. So it looks a bit like that, right? Transmitting node sends an inv. The receiving node says, yep, yeah, I want those headers. I want that data. And the transmitting node sends the headers and the block. I'll talk about that when I get to it, yeah. That's in about three or four slides. Any questions about sending, send headers? Okay, so send headers was the next step along, and that was a new control message in V12, protocol version 70012, and it's sent immediately after the version handshake. So you do your version handshake with your peer, and then you say send headers, All right? And it indicates that I want you to send me headers without sending the in first. And that saves us one round trip, right? It saves us the in get data, get headers round trip. And that's formally defined in BIP 130, if you want to look up the definition. So after V12, that's what it looks like. Send the headers, the receiving node sends back a get data, and the transmitting node sends a block. Okay, so what about compact blocks? The compact blocks reduce even more the, the round trip time and the bandwidth for propagating blocks. And it relies on this observation that if you're on the peer-to-peer -peer network and you're receiving transactions and blocks, when you receive the block, you've probably seen most of the transactions in that block already, right? Because you saw them when they entered your mempool. You saw them when they were propagated around before they got in a block. Um, it's enabled in a similar way to send headers. There's a send compact message, similar to send headers, but sent immediately after the version handshake, and it's defined in bit 152. So there's two, two modes. There's low bandwidth, same number of messages as headers first block syncing, but that saves a bit on, on the number of transactions that are sent in the, the compact block. And then there's a high bandwidth, which is for very quickly propagating blocks, blocks around the network. And it looks like this. So after your version handshake, you tell your peer, hey, I'm, I'm interested in compact blocks. And when he receives a block, he'll send you the compact block headers plus short IDs. And you'll say, um, get block. I'll talk about what those mean. Um, why did that happen? Oh, I'm missing a slide. Um, The compact block includes the header, the 80 bytes as normal, and it has short IDs for the transactions. So those are six byte identifiers for the transactions saying I'm including these transactions, uh, which I think you already have. Right? I think you've already seen these transactions, so I'm not gonna send you the full serialized transaction. I'm just gonna tell you this transaction was included in the block. And then the receiving node from those short IDs reconstructs a block based on transactions in its mempool. And if it doesn't have any, 
if there are some transactions missing from its mempool, it says, give me the remaining transactions. That's the get block TXN method. And the block TXN will send it those remaining transactions. Actually, I talk about this a bit more in my next, my next um, presentation. OK, th that was peer-to-peer. -peer. Any questions about peer-to-peer? -peer? That was really quick. So there's lots of detail that I skipped over. But. I know if it's premature, but what is the difference or um, what is the peculiarities of the Fever network compared to what we have described so far? Uh, the question was, what is, what is the fiber network? Um, and how does it differ from this? The fiber network sends blocks really quickly between miners. So the idea is to reduce that stale rate of blocks which don't become part of the main chain. And it uses forward error, error, connect, forward error correction. It sends blocks over UDP. Um, I don't know all the technical details, but it's just a really fast way of transmitting blocks. But is that an open network? Like yeah. Um, you'd need to download and compile the fiber client, but I believe you can just connect to it, yeah. Again, I, I, I don't know a great deal about fiber. Yep. Is there anything being done to kind of bypass or mitigate how how latency or firewall or Fiber? I think fiber would do that. Um, probably, yeah, I, I, again, it's not something I know a great deal about, but, so finally, this is the last session of the day, we've got about 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the mempool, um, so I'm going to have to rush a bit to get through this, I'm going to talk about what the mempool is, I'm going to talk about limiting and eviction in the mempool, and then, like, this grab bag of topics about things that connect to the mempool somehow, replaced by fee, signature caching, script caching, Going to talk a little bit more about compact blocks, and then I'll touch on fee estimation. And all of those topics down there somehow interact with the mempool in some way. So what's the mempool? Well, it's a nodes view of all of the transactions which haven't yet been included in a block, unconfirmed transactions. Um, transactions are propagated around the network using that in get data transaction. And if you receive a transaction message with a transaction in it, you validate that, verify that it's a valid transaction, and then you accept it into your mempool. And then miners have their mempool on their nodes, and they select transactions from that mempool to include in the next block based on the, the fee rate. That's how they, they choose the, the best fee-paying transactions. So often when people talk about the mempool, they talk about the mempool. There's no such thing. A mempool is something that is on your node. Your node's mempool might be slightly different from your peers, depending on what order you saw transactions in. Um, but we want them to be roughly the same. You, you know, if you've got a node on the network that's been there for a long time, we'd like you to have some kind of view of um, what other nodes are seeing, what transactions they're seeing. Um, like I said, nodes verify the validity, validity of transactions before they go into the mempool. They verify that they are consensus Valid, they'll also verify them. They'll check them against standard NIST rules, which is something I mentioned before. And double spends are not allowed. So if you have two conflicting transactions, the one that arrived first is the one that will stay in your mempool. Transaction chains are allowed. So you're allowed to spend from an unconfirmed transaction. You can have a, a chain of ancestors and descendants in your mempool. I think the default is 25 deep. Yeah. So like miners will be implementing different logic for allowing, let's say, a second transaction with higher fee. <coughs> Perhaps. I'm going to talk about replaced by fee later. But there's no, this isn't so consensus, right? Replaced by fee just to a double spend attack. They can do that, yeah. There's, I mean, it's not consensus, right? What they include in their block is up to them, as long as it's valid. But this is the, the Bitcoin core, and most implementations will except the first transaction they see, they won't allow double spends from that. Okay, so how do we limit that, and why do we need to? Well, a node's mempool is a private resource. It's memory on your own computer, and external parties could potentially abuse that, that resource, right? They could send you loads of transactions and fill up your mempool, and potentially make your, your computer fall over. 
So we need somehow to prevent that from happening. We need to limit how much resource an external party can use on our system. There's a few ways we do that. We evict, sorry, we expire old transactions. If a transaction has been in your mempool for longer than 14 days, it's probably not gonna get included in the block, right? It's been sitting around getting stale. Miners haven't included it for 1,000 blocks. So we age it out. And we also limit the size. The default maximum mempool size is 300 megabytes. Right? So we won't allow, once we reach 300 megabytes, we won't allow new transactions in, or rather, we'll start evicting the low fee paying transactions from our mempool, right? Because a mempool should be about transactions which will eventually get into a block. And so it makes sense to evict the low fee paying ones first because miners probably won't include those. Um, the fee rates calculation is done based on the package. And when, when we say package, we mean a collection of transactions, parents and um, descendants and ancestors. So if we have a chain of unconfirmed transactions, we'll look at the fee rate for that entire package of transactions because that's what the miner is optimizing for, right? So if we have a, a transaction that has a very low fee and a child which has a very high fee, then a miner might include both, right? They need to include the ancestor because otherwise the, the child is not valid. So they look at the fee rate for the entire package and that's what we do in our mempool as well. And there's another dimension to this. There's something called fee filter and that's me, my peer saying to my, sorry, my node saying to a peer, I'm no longer interested in transactions paying lower than this fee rate because my, I won't accept it to my mempool. Right, so I, I say, I'm not interested in transactions that pay less than five Satoshis per byte because my mempool won't accept them anyway. And that's defined in bit 133. Any questions about that? Okay, so replaced by fee. Replaced by fee is a way of unsticking your transaction. Say you send a transaction out to Bitcoin with a low fee or with a, a certain level of fee and the fee rate on blocks goes up, miners probably won't include your transaction because there are better paying transactions out there. And so it kind of gets stuck in this limbo in the mempool. And replaced by fee is a way of unsticking it. Right, we, sorry. Uh, we replace the old transaction with a new version with a higher transaction fee. Um, like I said earlier, a miner can choose to include any version of a transaction. The mempool is not consensus critical. Um, the mempool is not canonical. A miner couldn't choose which transaction they include. But like I said, most nodes won't accept, won't allow transactions to be replaced in the mempool in general. Right? That's, that's kind of the general rule. So in BIP125, we um, implemented this new feature called opt-in replaced by fee. And that is, that's saying, um, I'm sending this transaction, but I'm gonna allow it to be replaced later by a higher paying fee, right? It's basically allowing a double spend of your transaction or a replacement of your transaction to get into the mempool, but it's opt-in, right? You signal that you're gonna allow it. And you opt-in using the sequence number in one of the transaction inputs. Sequence number was the last field in that input that Jimmy talked about earlier. And you signal with a certain value in there, you're saying, I'm happy for this transaction to be replaced later if it's replaced by a higher fee paying transaction. So if the sequence number is less than FFFFFFFE, then the transaction is, in quotes, replaceable. Right, again, this is all, none of this is consensus. This is just nodes doing what we expect them to do. Any transaction could be included in the block, but this is me signaling explicitly saying, I'm happy for this node, to, this transaction to be replaced in the mempool. Does that make sense? Um, there's a few conditions attached to that. Replaced by fee could potentially be a DOS vector, right? I can, there's a limit to how many transactions I can send um, because there's a limit to the amount of money I have and if I don't include enough fee, those transactions won't be um, included or won't be propagated. RBF could be used, I could send a transaction and then I could bump the fee up a little bit and bump it up a bit more and like saturate the network that way. Um, so there's, there's conditions attached to replace by fee. Um, well, the first condition is it has to have this sequence number lower than 
that. Um, it, the replacement needs to have a higher fee, right? I can't replace by a lower fee, so I need to keep bumping up the fee. Um, the replacement doesn't contain any new unconfirmed inputs, and the replacement pays pays for its own bandwidth. So the, the delta between the old transaction and the new transaction needs to be at least some level, like some number of Satoshi per byte, 500 Satoshi or something like that. And the replacement does not replace more than 100 transactions. Any questions about RBF? Okay, we're ready. We're, we're getting through it. We've got three more topics. Um, so next I'm going to talk about signature caching. There's a few signatures. I don't know if you recognize any of those signatures. Um, so as I said earlier, transactions in general are seen twice if you're a fully connected node on the Bitcoin network. Um, you'll see them once when they're broadcast by the, the signing user and sent across the network. And then you'll see them the second time when they're included in a block. So obviously there's an optimization here. Rather than fully validate the transaction twice, you can partially cache the result of that transaction the first time. So when you see it in a block, uh, you don't have to do all of that transaction validation again. It means that block propagation is a lot faster because you don't need to fully validate all of the transactions in the block. Um, sign signature validation, that ECDSA stuff that Jimmy talked about earlier, where you're validating a, an ECDSA signature, that's really expensive. You've got to do a lot of elliptic curve additions and it takes a long long time, a lot of computing power. So, and each transaction usually, each transaction input, it usually includes at least one signature. So instead of, instead of evaluating those signatures twice, just keep a cache of those signature valid, validations, evaluations, and that was added in Bitcoin Core quite a long time ago, 0 0.7. There's a new, better version, script caching. And instead of just caching the signature validation, in script caching, we cache the validity of the entire script in an input. Because a Bitcoin script is context-free. If it's true now, it'll be true forever, independent of any contextual information. So we we cache the validity of the entire script sig evaluation. And that was added in 0 0.15, which came out in July. Does it make transaction caching? Signature, does it make signature caching? Um, more or less, it's, signature caching is still in there as kind of an edge, edge case DOS protection, but um, yeah, this would kind of make most of that redundant. And this stuff really does improve um, block validation times, like orders of magnitude. So why don't we just cache the entire transaction? Well, because transactions are contextual, right? The, valid the validity of a transaction depends on data outside the transaction. A transaction could be valid in one block, but invalid in a different block. For example, lock time is, is some kind of um, contextual validity for a transaction. So we, we can't just cache the entire validity of the transaction. Any questions about that before we move on? Um, okay, so why am I talking about this now? Well, because obviously this requires a mempool, right? It, re it requires that you've seen the transaction before you see the block. So that's, that's how it links back into the mempool. And you'll know you get more benefit from this the longer you've been online. Obviously, as your cache fills up with, as you see more transactions, when when you get a block, you would have seen a higher percentage of those transactions in the block. So the longer you're online, the better this cache will be functioning. And obviously, a blocks only node will not benefit from this. You can think of this in some ways as like front loading the the, valid, the validation of a block because you're you're valid, partially validating a block before you even see it. You're validating the transactions in that block before you even receive it. Okay, a bit more about compact blocks. And again, this will link into mempools somehow. Um, the compact block saves block propagation bandwidth and time, like I said earlier. And the way it does that is it doesn't include all of the raw transactions. Sorry. 
Um, it doesn't include all of the raw transactions, the serialized transactions, when it transmits a block. And that's defined in BIP 152. It was introduced in, I think, version 12 or 13. Um, there's low bandwidth. That will save on block propagation bandwidth, but not necessarily on time. And then high bandwidth, which is what really saves on block propagation time. So why, why is this interesting in terms of the, the mempool? Well, we receive a compact block which doesn't contain all of the full transactions. And that's the way, the way that works, is a trans transmitting node thinks, oh, this receiving node already has these transactions in its mempool. It's already seen them, so I don't need to include them in a block. Um, it refers to transactions by a short ID. That's a six-byte digest using this kind of this SIP hash 24 algorithm. And then the receiving node will take those short IDs and see if they map to transactions in its mempool and try and reconstruct that block itself. Right, so you're saving a lot of bandwidth and potentially you're saving time. And if, you've, if you're missing any transactions, if there are any gaps in your, in your mempool, you can send a get block TXN back saying, I've got some gaps, can you help me fill them in? So again, that requires a mempool, right? It requires that you've, st you've got this collection of transactions already in your mempool. Any questions? Okay, we're really close to the end. Uh, this is the last topic I'm gonna talk about. Fee estimation. So fee estimation in Bitcoin, your transactions all have fees. You're in some kind of competition with other users of the system to get your transaction into a block. And the way you differentiate yourself from other transactions, the way you induce miners to include your transaction in a block is to include, include a big fee, right? Or include an appropriate fee for how urgent your need is. That's how miners choose which transaction to include. And the prevailing fee rate can change quite a lot. We've seen this recently. We've seen it go up quite a bit and then down and up. Um, it really depends on a lot of factors, but it comes down to how much demand there is for the supply of block space. So estimating how much fee you need is quite difficult. It's a dynamic system. What you do or what some people do affects what other people do. The past is not necessarily indicative of what will happen in the future. It's an estimate. So we could use a mempool for this. We could look at a snapshot of the mempool and say, these are the outstanding unconfirmed transactions. These are what I'm competing against. Um, but there are problems with that, right? It's the expected time to wait for a block is always 10 minutes. So if the last block was nine minutes ago, the expected time for the next block is not one minute, it's another 10 minutes. That's a, that's a function of the Poisson distribution. So you don't know what's gonna arrive in the next 10 minutes. It doesn't account for lucky, in quotes, lucky and unlucky runs. Um, so you might have like three blocks in the space of five minutes, which would empty out the mempool and reduce the amount of fee required. Or you might have an unlucky run where there's 30 minutes without a block, the mempool fills up, and you need more fee to get into the block. Just looking at a snapshot does not give you that kind of depth of information. And again, there's no such thing as the mempool. You don't know exactly. You have an incomplete view of the outstanding transactions. All right, so you could use recent blocks. Um, and looking at recent blocks gives you an idea of how much fee was required to be included in a block. But again, this is also, there are problems with this. That's trivially gameable by miners. A miner could stuff his block with private high fee pay paying transactions and everyone looking at that on the network might think to themselves, oh, I need to include a really high fee because the last block only had high fees in. So you need a bit more information than that. And so what we do in Bitcoin Core is we look at recent blocks and we look at the mempool and we track how long transactions stayed in the mempool and how, you know, what fee they required based on time and fee. And that requires you to have a mempool. It requires you to have this historic view of what was coming into the mempool and what was included in blocks. So you need a large, large sample, you need recent transactions. And the longer you've been on, online, the longer you've seen the mempool, the better estimate you can make for fees. So that's another, you know, another aspect of the mempool we use. That's all I had. We need to be out of here in like five minutes. So are there any questions before we kind of wrap this up? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. You've listened to me for three hours blathering on. Thank you. <laughs>